So a pleasant good afternoon uh, to everyone. In terms of today's immunological class, we will be looking at the complement system. And complement system, you know, as the name suggests, it helps the immune system as it relates to doing its duties. And for that reason, it, that's why it is called complement, complement in terms of, of assisting. So when, let's, let's look at it from a slightly historic perspective in terms of how we will be approaching it today. We will look at the history, look at a brief introduction. We'll speak to the role it plays in both the innate and adaptive immunities, the components of the complement system, its function, and all the other things listed here. Okay, so from an historic perspective, it began in the 1890s when Jules Bourdais from the Pasteur Institute, he noticed that sheep antiserum to the bacterium vibrio cholera, which of course causes cholera, it caused lysis of the bacteria. So the, the found, he found that, you know, in terms of the observations, that this lytic property was observed. And heating the antiserum destroyed its bacteriolytic activity. So that is the ability of the bacteria to lyse other cells. When you did, when he did put in fresh serum that contained no antibodies against the bacterium, and it was unable to kill the back and was unable to kill the bacterium by itself, this restored the ability to lyse the bacteria, you know, by the heated antiserum. So from that he surmised these things. One, in that bacteriolytic activity, it requires two different substances, the specific antibacterial anti antibodies, and secondly, heat sensitive component, which is responsible for the lytic activity. And Eilrich, at the same time in Berlin, he was doing similar experiments. And he named that substance complement, defining it as the activity of serum that completes the action of antibodies. And for his work, he received the Nobel Prize in 1919. I would encourage you all when you do get the time to visit the Nobel Prize website, just type in Nobel Prize uh, in Google and it will take you to the site. It's a fascinating site. It has the history of all of these landmark discoveries as it relates to biology, well, not only biology, all the fields of endeavor related to the Nobel Prize. But for us, we'll be focusing on the field of physiology and or medicine. And you'll see all of these amazing discoveries that occurred over the period of time. And Bordet, you'll be able to see his acceptance speech where he does speak on the topic of the complement system. So I'd encourage you to have a look at it. Uh, very interesting read. Now, this complement system is a major effect of the humoral immune system. And while most studies link the activity of complement following the antibody binding, and we'll see that in just a second, specifically the different roles that complement plays in terms of initiating the destruction of foreign pathogens. So this major role for the system is recognition and destruction of the pathogens. So the components, and you might have seen it both on the website under the picture of um, Elon Musk, you would have seen that there's these pathways. It consists of more than 30 soluble and cell bounded proteins. So when you look at the pathways, which are all indicated by specific numbers associated coming at the ends of the arrows, all those refer to specific proteins. As I mentioned previously, when we talk about the world of biology, the world of immunology in particular, the functional aspects of biology always relates to protein, proteins are the doers, as it will. So always keep that in mind when we are looking at it. We looked previously when we were looking at cell signal transduction. We saw that you know the receptors at the level of the membrane is only they only become activated causing either one activation of G-coupled proteins to activate other proteins which are in a domino-like effect, which or, which eventually leads to signal transduction down to the level of the nucleus, ultimately leading to protein formation. So always remember when we're thinking about activities relating in the cell that most of them are facilitated by proteins. So these proteins, uh, they participate in both the innate and adaptive immunities, and they are produced by hepatocytes mainly, monocytes, and epithelial cells of the GI and the genitourinary 
tracks, right? We're into the, all of these are lined by smooth muscle in terms of the GI tract and the genital urinary tracts. Um, when you look at the genital urinary tract, both the ureters, urethra, with the exception of the bladder, the bladder is not lined by smooth muscle, but the ureters and the urethra, they are indeed lined by smooth muscles. Constitute 5% of the globulin weight, and many components are proenzymes or zymogens, which are functional. So what zymogens are? Of course, the enzyme is released in an inactive form, and it has to be in a it has to be activated usually by the cleavage of some functional domain or part of the protein, which then causes the inactive protein to now become active. And it could then do or carry out its catalytic effect as it relates to some activity within the cell itself. So let's talk about the role of the complement. So we're we'll looking at a number of things as it relates to the complement. Let's start with cytolysis, All right? So as the name implies, cytolysis, uh, cyto relating to cell, lysis, of course, meaning cut. So as it relates to organelle, what organelle within the cell itself is associated with cutting? I threw that one off, which organelle has lytic activity associated with it? So that would be the lyso. The lysosome. So I was going to ask if the ribosome, when they're making proteins, when they, when they stop there, that's not like cutting too, no? What, the protein itself? No. Yeah. Are you talking about post-translational modification of the protein after translation, right, within the cytoplasm itself? So yeah. it, does, it does get cut, but... In terms of lytic activity, that is not usually, uh, it does get cut off, but specifically there, there are um, enzymes that do it. But when we're referring to organelles that Relax. specifically, yeah, that specifically do um, lytic activity, we're looking at the lysosome, all right? So cytolysis, lysis of cells and bacteria, and of course viruses, this is the major effector. And cytolysis, what, by cutting the membrane or lysing it, it disrupts the membrane and entry of water and electrolytes into the cell. We have to remember when you're looking at the environment associated with any microorganism, be it a bacteria, vi a viral particle, you, it is in, encased by a membrane and the movement of things into and out of the membrane is a highly regulated process involving channels, involving diffusion gradients, involving lipid rafts, which are located and scattered throughout the membrane itself. So therefore, when lytic activity, or these enzymes actually cut through these membranes, it does affect or disrupt the entry of water and other electrolytes, because usually either you would have ATP generated movement of these um, electrolytes, and against a concentration gradient or by simple diffusion when you're thinking about movement from the area of high to low concentration across that membrane. So this is one of the things in terms of the functions of the complement as it relates to degradation of pathogen or pathogenic causing organisms. It does so by disrupting the membrane via cytolysis. Another one, opsonization. So these are the these are the proteins involved to, with opsonization. And what do they do? It promotes phagocytosis of particulate antigens. So when we look at it, it is extremely important, especially when the pathogen carries a capsule. So in this diagram, what we're noticing here, we see the here is the bacterium and the complement actually binds to it, targeting it for destruction from a phagocytotic cell. So the phagocytotic cell will have a complement receptor that binds specifically to these tagged bacterium. And of course, phagocytosis then occurs within a vesicle. So what happened within this vesicle? So how is it, how does destruction occur? We just, we just mentioned it. So how does destruction occur in a phagocytotic vesicle? Break down of the membrane and the proteins on the bacteria. Right, and which organelle contributes to that? Lysosomes. Yeah, the lysosome, right? Why does it have to take place within a vesicle? 
why it is then that you know it just couldn't well you know form it form around it let's just take it take it in within the cytoplasm and then release the enzyme from the lysosome so it doesn't infect the cell if... so right so you don't destroy the cell because um one of the terms i like to use as it relates to the lysosome or the action of those enzyme lytic enzymes they are indiscriminate with punishment you know indiscriminate i don't know i, I don't condone violence i don't condone, <laughs> condone violence at all even to children on that note you know it was with sadness i'm sure you all listened to what happened in texas as it relates to that um, related to that massacre in the um Kin, you know, kindergarten, and you have these children being killed, they go to school for lessons. Now you, they ended up dead. So I, I don't advocate, you know, any harm being done to children. But maybe you could show back your mind, you know, in your younger years, if you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time with your parents and lick Shane, you know, sometimes <laughs> as an innocent bystander, you know, you get your dose as well. So similarly, when you're looking at the action of the lysosome, should it release its enzymes within the cytoplasm, it will actually kill itself. There is a time when the cell would want to kill itself. Um, and sometimes it is referred to as programmed cell death. What is that um, function known as programmed cell death? Apoptosis. Very good, yeah. Well done, Salima. Right, apoptosis. Um, that's programmed cell death. And it, it is done, one, if the cell is overwhelmed, or two, sometimes, especially in utero, in the uterus, when you're looking at fetal development, that leads to the um, formation of, let's say, digits. Because initially, when you look at the digits in terms of fetal development, your hand actually looks like a ping pong paddle. And by destroying the cells, that you, if you now look at a completed hand, those spaces that you see between your fingers, uh, those cells, a message was sent to them to destroy the cells. And that is actually how you have your digits being formed. So the formation of digits, that's an example of apoptosis as it relates to fetal development. Let's go forward. So opsonin tags these uh, bacteria for destruction and then the phagocytotic cell could now come in, binds with its receptor, to the opsin to the complement system, complement molecules which have been bound to the bacterium. In this case, uh, 3BI, C3B, and the C4B proteins, and it binds to it. And then, of course, it's targeted for destruction in this way. Let's look at the activation of the inflammatory response. With this one, of course, inflammatory response. When you do have an injury and um, or when inflammation occurs, one of the things characteristic of it is the increase in circulation of the blood. Of course, uh, paralleling this in terms of the increase in the circulation of blood would be the increase in the circulation of the white blood cells, the leukocytes. So that is something that is very important and associated with the inflammatory response. So how does this occur? Well, you have specific binding of the complement receptors, and it triggers specific functions. Inflammation is one of them. And through inflammation, you have secretion of these immunoregulatory molecules, as shown here. So let, we see here um, phagocytosis occurring, but you do have these receptors on the phagocyte itself, where the complement receptor would bind. When you do have binding, you see this word here, extraversation. What does extraversation mean? Well, what it is, in terms of the term itself, it refers to this leakage of the blood, lymph, or other fluid from a blood vessel or into the tissue surrounding it, right? So in this case, you know, when the complement receptor uh, is activated through, the, through its binding, right, it causes then the leakage of the intracellular material, which then could um, assist in the breakdown of the bacterium or whatever is the foreign pathogen associated with it. In this case as well, you could have the binding leading to degranulation, which is the release, as you see here, release of granules associated with the immune system, which triggers this re immune response, which then could lead to the destruction of the pathogen which is invading. So the other thing we want to talk of is this clearance of the immune system. And again, one, one thing we are recognizing with the complement system is, well, the 
in terms of its role is really to support. We always have to remember that it supports the ongoing activity of the body's own immune system. So clearance, it removes immune complexes from the circulation and deposits them in the spleen and liver. So this is one way in terms of maintenance of the homeostatic environment as it relates to the destruction of pathogens. So we have to remember, even though destruction is occurring, you have to have this removal of the complexes. And this is facilitated in terms of this clearance. It is facilitated um, by the complement system. All right. So we looked at the mechanism of action. Now let's look at the pathways for complement activation. And do take note, there are three classical pathways. Um, truth be told, you know, as it relates to these three pathways, do take note, you have, you will see it in the notes in terms of the pathways, pay particular attention to the particular proteins. There's a diagram on the e, um, the e classroom, which highlights, you know, the different pathways, as well as showing the proteins associated with them. You'll be well placed just to take note of that diagram, which shows, you know, the different proteins associated with the complement. Let's talk a bit about them. So the pathways which are associated with it is the classical, the alternative, and the lectin pathway. Let's talk about them in a little more detail. The classical, of course, begins with the formation of the antigen-antibody complex, hand-in-glove antigen-antibody. One of the things relating to immunology, from the time you hear the word antigen, you should remember that there's a complementary antibody, you know, that binds to it. It's a hand in glove, antibody, antigen. The alternative pathway, this is initiated by cell surface constituents that are foreign to the host. I must, um, yeah, that's a little poopa there. And it is antibody independent. The final one, the lectin, is activated by the binding of the mannose binding lectin to mannose residues on glycoproteins. So when we're thinking about these glycoproteins or carbohydrates, complex sugars, glycoprotein sugar bound to the proteins, mannose binding, so-called, because it's a sugar, it binds specifically to it. So it looks um, for them on both the glycoproteins and the carbohydrates. Now this system, it works as a cascade. And what do you mean cascade? Very similar to the signal transduction, where you have binding at the level of the receptor on the membrane, and therefore a domino-like effect occurs. When the binding you have, when binding occurs, now you have the transformation, conformationally, of a protein. Always remember, in terms of looking at pro examination of proteins, protein structure is related to its function. So if let's say at the level of the uh, receptor, when you do have binding and conformational change occurs, so just, in the, you know, it might not sound like much, well, okay, you have binding and yes, so it changes conformation when it does bind. Yeah, but structure and function changes its function. So now you could move from the zygomen, as we mentioned, the, these uh, zygogen uh, from the inactive form to the active, and now this active form could then initiate a cascade of reactions to occur. And this is what happens with the uh, complement system. So this cascade activation, that the, in terms of the uh, protocol used in the, in the nomenclature, the proteins are designated by uppercase letter C and are inactive until they are split into products. These products, when they split, they are now, so they move from the zymogen to the active form. And the active form are usually designated with a lowercase a or b. So inactive capital, lowercase in, uh, indicates the active form. All right. So here is a showing the classical pathway, which is considered part of it, of the specific immune response, because it relies on the antibodies to initiate it. So here we have a microbe, and again here we have the antibodies binding to its specific receptors, and of course the complement protein. Is this one active or inactive? This protein here, C1. Inactive. Why would you say it's inactive? Capital C. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, of, of course, yeah. So because of the fact it's written with a C, capital C, that means the inactive form. So what happening? Binding, conformational change conformational change, structural change, right? And then it could lead to the activation of the protein, right? Once it's activated, once C1 is activated, a cascade occurs, and then you have these other proteins being activated by a process of cleavage, right? So you know, um, 
was it Lillian mentioned that, you know, for instance, post-trans, during synthesis of proteins in the cytoplasm, when you have post-translational modification occurring, yes, you know, you have cleavage occurring of certain parts of the protein such that you get the final functional form. So in a similar way, the same thing is happening here. So initially with C1, you have, <coughs> excuse me, Right, so cleavage, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, right, so you have cleavage. Uh, of course, in a cascade, you know, so this one is initially cleave, and when it's in the activated form, it leads to the cleavage of C2 and C4, they are now activated, and then so is it in a domino type effect, all of these happening, you have this cascade, a certain, a certain set of proteins, these are actually activated, all due to the fact of C1 being initially activated due to the antibodies associated with binding to the uh, microbe, all right? And this is us showing in terms of from the continuation of the pathway. So we reach the C2B, this is the third one. And then it continues with the binding and activation. The function of this C3 activation complex is to activate a C3 protein. So now you have another set of proteins in terms of moving from the C2B to the C3, and then activation occurs. And this is done by cleavage. So again, proteolytic cleavage occurs in which you have activation of these proteins, domino effect, All right? So this is showing, so one of the products, which is shown here, C3A, when it is formed, it is associated with an increase in the inflammatory response. And it does so by binding to mast cells, causing them to release histamine. Now, what does histamine do? What is histamine usually associated with? When you go to the drugstore, we, we, we buy um, antihistamines. So what is histamine? Why do we do that? Inflammation. Okay. Right, so, right, right, runny nose, right, sneezing, and some of these, some people might be having it a little worse now as it relates to the dust. So histamine, when you think about it, right, it um, causes this, this effect and inflammation usually follows. So you need to get antihistamines to uh, restrict the amount of inflammation which occurred. With some persons, it could, of course, be particularly severe. And if it is in that regard, well, it could sometimes lead to uh, asphyxiation, right? So that is always important then to have your antihistamines present, particularly if you're sensitive, let's say, to things like bee stings and so on. What is one of the pluses of histamine in terms of having that initiated in the inflammatory response? We mentioned it, it increases circulation to the localized area. So let's say site of an infection, it increases circulation, bringing in more blood, bringing in more white blood cells. So now they could have um, an effect in terms of lessening the spread of any pathogen or microorganism within that localized area. And that is why histamine is reduced to initiate that cascade, which causes inflammation. So these C, um, in terms of the cascade, we're looking at C3B. So when you are looking at the cascade, right, do take note of the different proteins and their functionalities, right? So from C1 to C2, C2A, in terms of the active forms, C3A, this is just telling you specifically what these proteins do. And now we're moving to C3B. And these are produced by C3 activation complex and they bind and coat the surface. So it's an obstinate, so obstinization. What would you call an obstinate then? If you had to describe it in using uh, your own words, how would you describe it? it as, uh, what, what comes to mind for me is the name of a movie, but how would you describe it in, you know, in five words or less? What is an obstinate? Obstinates do what? <laughs> 
you know, in terms of you, if you, let's say, you know, you were describing it and you're talking about a pathogen, what do they do to them? Marked for? Would that begin with D? So you're marked for? For this, for the, I'm listening. Mark for destruction. Yeah, I was thinking Mark for death. Was, was that the name of a movie? Mark for death? Yes, no, maybe? Before your time. Yeah, okay, back in time, okay. I want to say that with Charles Bronson. Yeah, Mark for that. Yeah, he was a bad guy, you know, tough guy. Yeah, so Mark for destruction, but that is what very true, right? So when you think of, a, or when you hear obstinization, Mark for destruction or Mark for death. All right, so eventually, right, what you'd have happening in terms of the cleavage, uh, the C24, C2B and the C24, which make up the complex, it has a slight affinity. And when they bind, it forms a new complex, which is referred to as the C5 activation complex. So these cleaved parts of the protein, they form a separate activation complex known as the C5. And what does it do? Well, this complex is activates C5 proteins by cleaving them further into C5 A and B. And these proteins are produced by this activation complex. These then begin to coat the surface of the bacteria. So ultimately, in terms of this pathway, you're having opsonization and you're co having the coating of the bacteria with uh, certain signals in the form of proteins, which are really marking them for death. So it's shown, uh, shown here. Here we're seeing, you know, the C5A release of histamine, right? It disperses away from the bacteria and it binds to the mast cells and increases inflammation. We mentioned that. And it's a chemoattractic factor known for leukocytes. So the C5A, here we are seeing them. It's a chemoattractant to these leukocytes because now they'll be able, after seeing the marked bacteria, well, they're marked for death. So phagocytotic activity could occur from these cells. All right, so we mentioned C3. The C3 complex is formed, it forms the C5, which is really the membrane attack complex. Let's see what it does. So the C5B on, on the surface of the bacteria it binds to C6, which is another protein that is present. And this binding activates C6, so that it can bind to C7. So on the surface of the bacteria, with the C5 that is tagged, right, it binds C6, now the C6, activate C6 so I can bind C7. So again, all of this is a domino type effect, right? So it's all happening, happening together. The C7 then binds C8, which in turn binds many C9s. And then these together form what is known as a membrane attack complex or the MAC or MAC. Now, if you could, which is why I said, you know, it's so good to read the work, you know, of the Nobel Prize winner to see how they actually figure this out. You know, in terms of all of these proteins, of course, if you're uh, a biochemist, you'll probably understand it better. But it's very, very interesting the way they figured out how all how all of these uh, proteins interrelate were interrelated. So let's talk about this MAC or the membrane attack complex. So attachment causes binding, binding and polymerization of C9, a perforin-like molecule to this part of the complex and the completed membrane attack complex has a tubular form and it forms a pore size of approximately 70 to 100 angstroms, right, in size. So one of the, the end results of it, of the of coming together of all of these proteins, it forms a pore. And this pore, what does it do? It causes cytolysis, the membrane attack complex, it causes cytolysis. And of course, with cytolysis, membrane is compromised. So electrolytes, now they're able to be lost. And you also have disruption in the movement of water. So that's very important. All right, so this is just giving the overview of what we are speaking to in terms of first opsonization occurring, right? Opsonization, so the tagging of these, uh, my of the bacteria. After you have the tagging antibody complex, antibodies come in, they bind, and they initiate the cascade of reactions, which ultimately lead to this formation of the MAC complex, which leads to the destruction via uh, lysis of the membrane, causing electrolyte loss, and of course, disruption in the water balance, which exists across the membrane itself.
All right, so that was one. So now let's look at another one, the alternative pathway. Now, this alternate is part of the non-specific and it is slower than the classical. So the classical one, right? That's the, the one that occurs in most of the times, but you also have another pathway, right? An alternative pathway. And this one is antibody independent. So whereas when we looked at the classical, it did involve the antibodies to initiate the C1 cascade with the alternative pathway, it's independent. And the activation, it's just a component of the innate immune system. So that's something important to note in terms of the differences. When we're looking at these three pathways, one of the good thing to do in terms of when you're reviewing them is to draw them up. And the first thing to look at, I would say, you know, draw a little chart. What are the differences and similarities among these different pathways? All right, so that's a nice little chart you could do, and that will hold you in good stead. So the C1, C4, and the C2, they are not involved in the alternate pathway. But for serum proteins shown here, they are involved in this pathway. Let's have a look and see how what they do. So C3 uh, contains the unstable thioester, thioester bond. And this unstable bond it makes C3 subject to slow, spontaneous hydrolysis to both C3 and C3 and C3A. C3B and C3A, they are formed as a result. This is able then to bind to foreign surface antigens, and the mammalian cells themselves contain sialic acid, which inactivates C3B. So we're looking at to focus on the C3A. C3B on the surface of a foreign cell binds to another plasma protein called factor B. So the C3A split into the C3, split into C3A and C3B, it binds and now the B factor comes in and binds to it. Now this binding of the C3B to the factor B allows a protein enzyme called factor D to cleave factor B to BA, the activated form BA and BB. So this is shown here, C3 cleaves to C3, B and A, right? The A isn't part of the complex, but the C3B then binds to factor B. Factor B then causes, uh, after binding in cohorts with factor D, it causes the formation of this complex to occur. So the binding of C3B to the factor B allows a protein enzyme called factor D to cleave factor B to BA and BB. So this is cleavage occurring here. And BB remains bound to C3B while BA and factor D disperses away. All right. So here we are seeing what is also form is propidin. Now propidin, which is also called a uh, factor P, this binds to the complex and stabilizes it. So very important to note uh, what the role of propidin, what it does, it stabilizes the complex and this complex, it makes up the activation complex for the alternative pathway. So C3 activation then, it causes the production of more C3B. So once C3 is activated, you have more and more C3B being formed. And this allows initial steps of the pathway to be repeated over and over and amplified. So ultimately what you have happening is the formation of a whole lot of molecules can be generated in a relatively short space of time. And when this occurs, you have additional C3B binding to the C3 activation complex, this converts it into a C5 activation complex. So here we had C3B, under the action of convertase, you have the formation of this C5 complex here, C3B, B, 3B. C5 going now into C5B and C5A, and this leads to the begins the production of a membrane attack complex. As we saw with the classical system, this membrane attack complex is really a pore in the membrane, which allows the movement of fluid out of the cell into and out of the cell disruption, disrupting fluid 
um, the water movement and also electrolyte movement as well. So this is it in terms of the overview uh, from C3, starting initially with C3, in terms of the whole cascade of reaction, ultimately leading to the formation of the membrane attack complex. So very important to note with both the classical and alternative pathways, how the formation of this MAC occurs, the membrane attack complex. So the lectin pathway, this is one which originates with the host proteins when they bind to the microbial surfaces. We mentioned lectin is a protein that binds uh, to the carbohydrate and mannose binding lectin, of course, my sugar binding lectin. In the acute phase protein, it's an acute phase protein, sorry, which binds the residues on the surface of the microorganism. And then we have MASP one and two, membrane bound ligand associated serine proteases, and their structures are very similar to C1R. Now let's talk a bit about MBL, this mannose binding lectin. Now during inflammatory responses, it binds to the surface of a microbe, that's the first step, um, associated membrane bound lectin associated proteinases, mass one and two, it would bind to the MBL. This complex, it mimics the activities of C1R and C1S, and it causes cleavage and activation of C4 and C2, very much from the, like the classical pathway. And thus, the lectin pathway is also antibody independent and is an important defense mechanism con comparable to the alternative pathway, because both of them are antibody independent. Classical, of course, it needs to have that antibody to initiate it, whereas the other two, they don't. It utilizes the components of the classical pathway, except for the C1 protein. So let's look at that diagrammatically. And it just shows then. So take note of this in terms of when you're going it over. A good exercise will be not only to diagrammatically look at the movement of this cascade of proteins, but also to see or to form make a table to show the differences among the classical lectin, lectin and alternative pathway. But ultimately, we do have this membrane attack complex being formed on the surface of the bacteria, if that is the case in terms of the pathogen, which then leads to its destruction. All right. So these are just uh, some of the important definitions which we mentioned, the C1 inhibitor right, a very important regulator. It's a serine protease inhibitor. What do they mean by a serine protease inhibitor? I mean, it's, well, yeah, the name gives it away, but what does what it, what, is, what, is, what do serine protease inhibitors do, as the name suggests? Right, so serine proteases these are very important enzymes which cleave uh, peptide bonds in proteins. Right, so they're very important. So therefore, serine protease inhibitor or the serpins, as they are known, what they do is they just stop that function from occurring. In this case, the C1 inhibitor it irreversibly binds and it inactivates these two proteins, the R and S form, as well as the Manos activating serine proteases in the lectin pathway. So that's a C1 inhibitor. Factor H does all of these things with ultimately with both um, cofactors activity for the C3B cleavage and decay accelerating activity against both C3B, uh, C leading to C3BB, uh, which is C3 convertase. All right, so it's important then to appreciate and to know these definitions. So again, as I mentioned, you know, at the top of the class uh, two days, well, two, two sessions ago, always good to have the definitions clear in your mind. It would uh, cement the functionality for you. Propidin, right? So this is what propidin does in terms of the protection. Uh, the factor cleaves, cleaves, it cleaves cell bound or cell phases of the C3B and C4B. 
And the DAF, this is what DAF does, the gain accelerating factor. It acts on both the classical and the alternative pathways. It doesn't act on the lectin pathway. C4B and the complement receptor one, protectin and vitronectin S protein presents on self cells to prevent complement from damaging them. So what we're looking at, we're looking at a set of different proteins associated with the three classic, well, the three pathways. And it's very important to know protectin. And the person who did name the protein, actually they linked uh, the definition with functionality, it protects. Right? And this is one of the ways in terms of identification of cells as it relates to the immune system, which makes it very unique, the immune system in terms of recognition of self. If the immune, could you think of any diseases in which the immune system uh, goes awry in terms of not recognize, recognizing self and therefore it begins to attack itself? What comes to mind? Usually they're associated with neurological uh, ailments. Could you think of any? But the immune system begins to, not only neurological, I'm thinking of one, five letters. So how about alopecia? That's not that the cells destroy any hair follicle. Alopecia in terms of, uh, they have different types of um, alopecia in terms of, so you have male pattern baldness. Some do have a, well, I suppose you can argue all of them have a genetic component to it, but destruction of the hair follicles, yes, there is that, that instance, yes. And that would be because it doesn't recognize self, right? There's there's a one that could fit the word the wordle category. Anybody here plays wordle by chance? I don't know. No, all right. <laughs> it's a nice way to build vocabulary. Well, it's five letter with W R D L E. Let's type it in Google. You have five chances to to build a word. Right, a five letter word, and you just have to guess the letters. And it, it, it's, it's a nice way and a short, challenging way to start your day. Wordle. All right, um, so a five letter word, what I'm thinking about is lupus. Uh, lupus is another instance where you have it's an autoimmune disease in which the body begins to attack itself. Now, isn't that a horrible thing when you think about? I would say, of all the ailments, when you imagine yourself is attacking yourself. That's you know when it logistically it, it's 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 horrid, right? And in certain instances, it's protecting in terms of that protein is no longer being recognized. So therefore, the body sees it as foreign invader and therefore it attacks it. What comes to mind as well, you know, you have different ones. You have um, MS, right? Um, in which the body um, begins to attack the nervous system, um, myelin, it, it specifically with myelin. So the myelin protection of the uh, axon is no longer there. So while it is, you might be consciously thinking of a thought, I say raise my right leg, but it doesn't, does not reach to the level of the leg itself to initiate contraction or stimulation of muscle to cause movement. ALS is another one, amelotrophic lateral sclerosis. All right. I don't know if anybody, if anybody knows of anyone who had it, amelotrophic lateral ALS. No, so that one, that one is usually, uh, it happens very quickly. It's also known as Lou Gehrig's, excuse me. Garrick's disease. Yeah, because he was a famous baseball player. When you do have the time as well, it does make for interesting um, listening. You know, he, he made a very moving speech when he announced that he was retiring from baseball, right? Because he was beginning to lose control, you know, of his muscles. So when you do have the time, you could YouTube it, YouTube Lou Gehrig speech. And here it, it, it it's it's quite it's quite um, pertinent, I think, in these times to to to, to hear you know eloquent speeching speeches, right? So Lou Gehrig disease is another. So MLS, Lou Gehrig, lupus, um, alopecia, in in some instances, right? All of these things relate to immuno. <laughs> 
deficiencies which cause then ultimately um, the body being attacked by itself. Right? So then here we have in terms of the clinical aspect, um, the deficiencies of C3, you do have it uh, causing recurrent pyogenic sinus and respiratory tract infections. These are some of the clinical aspects which occur. So deficiency of the C5 to C8 and the man binding lectin makes you predisposed to serve the necessary bacteria. Deficiency of C1 leads to angioedema. Deficiency of DAF causes increased complement mediated hemolysis. Right. Transfusion, mixed matches, activation of complement, generate large amount of anaphylotoxins, and of course, the membrane attack complexes. And this leads to red cell hem hemolysis, not homo, hemolysis, right? And what happens in a case like this, right? You're going to, now it's, it's a fact, it's a tragic fact that globally every year, Right? They make this mistake as it relates to transfusion mismatches, which is why should you or any of your relatives, let's say, taking on a transfusion, it's always good to watch them. With, now, if something goes wrong within about half hour, you will know. Right? And what do you think some of the markers, if, if they give you somebody wrong, the wrong type of blood? Now, of course, it could be done for a number of reasons. One, let's say there are a number of persons you know, on the ward Oh, and they're bringing more than, you know, bringing blood to be transfused. And very simply, you know, person tired and they make a mistake, they put the wrong blood down. So always, you know, as an informed person, always check out the blood type. Everybody here knows their blood type? Yes, sir. Oh, that's very good. All right. But if you haven't, it's a very simple test. You, you, actually, they, they sell the test. You can actually do it. A woman? And mm -hmm. Chanel actually got the wrong um, blood and she was able to sue the Ministry of Health. She got was, it happens globally. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not something that is unique, I would say, to Trinidad. No, 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 I just think that it happened. No, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Oh, no, no, I, I'm not showing aspersions at you, and I agree fully, and it's, you know, but it, what, what I'm saying is, for some other reason, you know, it's, a, it's an avoidable mistake. And, but it happens all over the world. In the, so the, in other words, then there is luck, well, that I'm aware of, I must do some more research, that they don't have these deaths occurring every year. You know, and it's sad, it's sad and tragic, right? But it is avoidable. So what do you think are some of the markers when you do have, when you get any wrong blood, what do you think will happen physically? Fever. Yeah, that's usually the first marker in terms of when you start to get the transfusion. Anybody here ever got blood, a blood transfusion? Yeah, I got a blood transfusion one time, and which is why, you know, they, they always watch you for about the first, or they keep coming back, you know, ever so often, I say every 10 minutes, and they keep checking on you and your temperature. They look at your temperature, you know, they look at your pupils, of course, they, to make sure you're conscious, they'll ask you some silly questions, which is good, you know, like what's your name and so on, to make sure you're coherent, right? But the temperature is usually the best guide. If something is wrong, your temperature, and if left unchecked, you would be going to um, shock, right? You'll begin to convulse and so on. But on, as I said, globally, it's a problem. So maybe, you know, one of the things you could focus on is how, how is it, what could I do to ensure that transfusion mismatches do not occur? Maybe you could come up with something or a protocol as well. What is another thing that happens with a certain amount of regularity, which I find is very tragic when babies get locked in cars, yeah? Yeah, so that is another tragedy. And, you know, you could think about these things in terms of what solution could I come up with? So not only from a biological aspect or from a practical standpoint so that these things wouldn't happen or it reduce significantly the deaths associated with them. So you mentioned the autoimmune diseases and the complexes, they bind complement, but you have low complement levels and activate that and information um, activation and this could then lead to tissue damage as it relates to autoimmune diseases. Some instances you have severe liver disease, 
we have the fish and complement proteins. And again, remember complement, they're very marked for death. You know, that should, it should, when you think about complement initiation, think about those, notwithstanding the formation, of course, of the, um, the pore, which causes the movement or interferes with the diffusion gradient and electrolyte movement across the membrane. But always remember, mark for that. And then, of course, factor one deficiency, which leads to low levels of C3. And of course, that interferes with the complement pathway. Mutation in factor one gene, which is implicated in the development of hemolytic uremic syndrome, AGS. Okay. All right. And that is the uh, end of the lecture for today. Let me just stop there.